anyway, great. Um, so thanks everybody for signing up anyway for uh, what Colin has coined the RSGB PTWQT, um, if you can remember that. <laughs> Uh, just a couple of technical points to run through before we before we get started. Um, there's a number of people in the audience who have uh, pre-submitted questions, and I think Nick's been in contact with you. Um, when he asked you if you are ready to deliver your question, if you could just click the raise your hand function, and then I'll give you the permission to speak, because the default settings for this webinar is that everybody's on mute, uh, so there's no interference. Uh, obviously, if you've not pre-submitted a question and you have something you'd like to ask, um, you are more than welcome to as well. Uh, again, you can do this by, by using the raised hand function uh, and then we will give you permission to speak. Uh, alternatively, if you don't want to do that, uh, the chat function is available uh, and I'll be monitoring that and feeding the best questions or as many questions as we can into the session itself. Um, I think that's all from me, so I'll hand over to you, Nick. A couple of questions, Ed, from me before we start, just so we're clear on it. Are we recording this? Uh, sorry, yes, the session is being recorded. Yeah, and the second thing is... Uh, I can't remember what I was going to say now. There was something else crucially important. Yeah, the second thing was to say to, to the audience that if you raise your hand and want to want to put a question, you don't appear, your, your image won't appear on the screen. So don't worry if you're in your pajamas. You know, <laughs> it'll, it'll just for your name that appears, not not your image. So uh, so don't don't hold back if you do want to participate by uh, in person. So um, but you can also use the chat line down the side as well. So um, so so there we go then. Right. If I can start off by. We're running this for an hour or so. If it if it if it dries up horribly before an hour, I'm going to bring it to a bring it to a merciful conclusion. If it runs over by ten or fifteen minutes, if it's good and lively, I hope you won't mind if I if I do let it run for just an extra few minutes if there's interest going. So um, that's that's the rules, as it were. Now I'm going to introduce your panelists, if I may, to start with. First of all, Karen Cole, who's director of safety and training at the MCIA. Karen's been involved in powered re two wheeler safety at the MCIA mm -hmm. for more than 20 years, although she doesn't look old enough. In 2013, she led the team which set up MCIA Ride, the Specialist Vocational Training Centre for Motorcycle Instructors and Motorcycle Training Businesses. More recently, in 2019, she co authored The Route to Tomorrow's Journeys, a landmark policy document written by the MICA in association with Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership. Hello, Karen, how are you? Hello, I'm well, thanks. Thank you for inviting me. No problem, it's good. Our second panellist is Dr Chris Burgess, Senior Lecturer in Psychology at the University of Exeter, thankfully unaffected by the recent bombing of the city. Um, so, um, Chris, it's good to have you here. He's the motorcycling lead for the National Driver Offender Retraining Schemes, NDORS, as we all know it. And his motorcycle in intervention, the Rider Re Risk Reduction Course, was adopted in 2008 as the National Ride Scheme model, model by ACPO, now, of course, NPCC. Hello, Chris. Hi there, Carl and Nick. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Yeah, I'm good. Colin Brown is Director of Campaigns and Political Engagement at the Motorcycle Action Group, MAG, as we all know it. Colin has taken all the advanced training available and been immersed in motorcycle road safety for many years, as well as having first-hand experience of how much pain is involved in getting it wrong, which Ian can tell us about in a minute as well. Um, describing himself as an observer and critic rather than a practitioner of road safety, Colin strives to bring a creative approach to difficult questions, which I can vouch for having, having interviewed him in the past. Hello, Colin. Hello, yeah, I'd like to, like to uh, be provocative. Stir it up is probably a good word, yeah. Absolutely. Good. And finally, last but not least, Ian Temperton, who these days is a consultant with his own, he's got his own consultancy called Traject, Road Safety Specialists. But we probably know Ian better as team leader from North Suffolk County's Road Safety Function, where he identified the need to engage a full-time road safety officer specifically to address power to wheeler issues, with the team developing and delivering a number of high profile interventions. He's also worked in partnership with the Police College and TSO to produce online roadcraft training modules. And he's also a former Director of Communications for Road Safety GB. Ian, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Nick. You look very well. Are you sure you're fully recovered from your recent incident? It was a minor thing. Okay, you don't want to tell us about it then, I guess? Well, no, it's not, not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And very embarrassing, so no, I won't. <laughs> That's what I was hoping you were going to say, yeah. Now, now most of the questions today have come from people that have preset them but we're going to take questions as we go along as Ed has already said there's one or two that I've come up with myself with one or two with help from one or two people who got knowledge of the sector and we're going to start with one of those if that's okay and it relates to the manufacturers and retailers and the question is it's clear that motorcycles are principally marketed on their capacity for speed and performance 
should manufacturers and retailers be doing more to keep their customer base alive? And I think the perfect person to go to to kick this one off is Karen, obviously. All right, see what I can do here. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously different types of motorcycles are marketed in different ways, specific to their own purpose. Um, performance is sort of relative to the type of use that, that they'll be getting and not necessarily down to speed. Um, for example, a motorcycle that's designed to be used as a commuter machine will be described as performing well relative to its use. Other types of vehicle are marketed in the same way. For some product groups, which I guess is what you're probably referring to, the sports motorcycles, yeah. um, marketing does continue to address the customer's interests and needs, um, but so do boats and sports cars and lots of other things. Sports motorcycles make up less than 8% of our sales at the moment. Um, so the number of adverts that actually depict products like this are much fewer than you would have found 10 years ago. In fact, 20 years ago when I started, um, that, that was the big problem for motorcycling. They were taking 40, 50% of the market uh, and now they're not. Um, so I don't think this marketing is as widespread as you'd imagine it to be. But if you go out and look for it, you'll find it, obviously. Yeah. Um, manufacturers naturally spend their money where the market is. So if only 8% of the market is on the sports bikes, then 92% of their budget will be elsewhere. Um, I think with regard to whether the manufacturers do enough to keep users safe, the vehicles are all manufactured to much higher standards than they ever were and have far more technology on to help the riders with ABS, traction control, stability control, and, and all sorts of other patented goodies that, that help riders to do that. And they were all introduced to make riding safer and to protect the riders. Um, so I think, uh, but I think there's more technology you know, in the background and, and we've got a, a, lot, a lot further to go still. So motorcycles will, become safer in that way. Um, I think the industry itself recognises that it's probably about 40% of accidents are down to the riders and about 60% have a lot of other factors involved. Um, it's unlikely that vehicle design is contributing massively to that, but uh, we do, re do recognise that we could do more and we're currently um, in the process of launching a new campaign to encourage uh, changes to rider behaviour and um, to help them with a, to help them with training and improving their skills. So, um, yeah, we will be doing things and we are doing things. But I do think as that market, as some of the markets change, you'll, you will see different different adverts out there and, and different messages out there. Um, but the speed one is not so much as it was. So speed is not so much of an issue in terms of marketing as it used to be. Mm. And you're broadly happy that the industry itself is doing uh, enough to, to, to keep people safe on their machines. Well, we think so. I'm sure others may have differing views, but <laughs> that's what we think. You know, on the panel, want to chip in there and comment? Yeah, Ian. If I, yeah, if I can, please, Nick. I mean, certainly from the practitioner's perspective, looking less so at the manufacturers, but more so at the retailers. Um, you know, looking at my experience in a Shire County, we had a, a number of retailers in the county. Two or three of them were excellent in promoting safety messages to their client base. They, they would um, get us into events at their dealerships. They would help us out. They would promote the training offer that we have. The rest of them were not interested. Despite repeated approaches and regular contact, they were only concerned about shifting the units out of the door um, and moving on to the next customer. And we're not talking about sort of you know, the smaller dealers, we're talking about some very big badge dealers who just didn't engage. And it's a very short-sighted approach because you know, essentially, as it said in the question, we, we're trying to keep their customer base alive mm -hmm. and in one piece. If somebody has a bad crash, if they survive it, they may not come back to motorcycling. The fact they've had a crash may put off other people who want to engage in motorcycling. So surely it's in everybody's interests to engage in keeping everybody safe and in one piece. And it is, uh, from my perspective, it is incredibly disappointing that a large proportion of the retailers don't engage with the sort of messaging that we're after. That's interesting. Um, anyone else on the panel want to, to, to chip in here before? Yeah, Colin, yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's a very interesting question. It, it does, it does in, in my mind, raise, raise a few questions. I'm going to bring it back to um, what I put at the end of, end of my uh, video presentation in terms of a, of a mantra, um, is that uh, it's easy to blame somebody else, but what we need to do is focus on our own 
behaviours. And I say certainly from, I say speaking from the riders' perspective, um, we have to understand that uh, the industry, the, um, the the dealerships are basically giving people what they want. So if that's what they are signalling they want, um, it's not surprising that the industry uh, and, and the dealerships are going to be providing that. Um, and certainly when it comes to um, uh, road safety messaging, um, as I've said before, I do think there's a significant proportion of the riding public that gets put off by, by the way that the messaging is put forward. And therefore, it's not unsurprising to, to find that a dealership may not want to push that messaging if it's switching off its potential customers. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a good reason why it happens. Um, the, the big question, of course, is how we solve all these problems and actually get everybody to, to, uh, to pull in the right direction, which is obviously uh, reducing the number of casualties overall. So you, you're kind of, you've got some sympathy and empathy with the, with the retailers who are there to sell the machines effectively. And, uh, and what you're saying is that Ian's... Yes, yeah, Ian, ab Ian, absolutely. Ian, Ian, Ian's, Ian's message is a bit optimistic in terms of getting them involved in overtly safety, safety campaigns and initiatives. Chris, did you want to say anything on this one before we go to the audience? All I would say, really, Nick, is that people who want to buy a motorcycle because the speed and the, the thrill, the risk is, is attractive to them, they are probably the kind of people who would also engage in other high-risk activities, pastimes, things like scuba diving, things like skydiving. And actually, with those other activities, it's very rare for somebody to be able to engage with uh, a skydive or, or to go scuba diving without having received some training first, um, without the organizations who are selling the, the kit, um, promoting the training, promoting safety. Um, I can certainly sympathize from, from Colin's perspective with um, you know, the manufacturers who are essentially servicing the market, um, but I think they do have some responsibilities to ensure that riders who are buying their products and particularly those who are buying sports bikes and are therefore attracted not by the mobility, not by the convenience of, of a motorcycle, but, but actually by the speed and the risk uh, and the thrill aspect. I think they do have a responsibility to try to ensure that there is some training taking place and that the riders appreciate the risks involved in, in riding a high performance motorcycle. That's fascinating. So we've got quite a range of views within the panel itself. So what about in, 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 in the audience? Anyone want to come in and chip in and, uh, and, and comment on this discussion? Ed? Um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, there's also a raised hand from Lane Hardy. I can't see the raised hand function, I'm sorry. So you have to, you have to sort it out for me, I'm afraid. Not That's sort right. of, you have to, um, have to, 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 to notify me of those. Here we go. Yes. Um, yes, as you... Oh, Hello. Hello. Hello, how are you? Sorry. I'm fine. <laughs> sorry, Good. it's Elaine Hardy here. I, uh, for those that know, I did a, uh, along with a couple of, or three other, um, researchers, we carried out a global study on motorcycle crashes. So we studied uh, 30 countries, 1,578 riders, they all responded. With regards to the style, effectively 31% were naked street bikes. Uh, super, super sports and sports tourers were 25%. Then you had adventure motorcycles, 16%, etc., etc. et cetera. In other words, from what I could see, the style of the bike didn't really make any difference regarding the, the crash. They were just, it was proportionate to the rest of the other styles. And also in terms of speed, same issue. It wasn't though that the sports bikes or super sports bikes were any faster than the naked street bike or the adventure motorcycle. So I think... Well, what about this it, specific point, Elaine, of getting yeah. de de dealers and manufacturers involved in safety? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I've always said, and in fact, I, I was very critical uh, a few years back. One of the uh, catches uh, for, for selling mopeds was ride like our heroes. So you were selling mopeds with 46 on the side of it, which, you know, <laughs> was evidently not, the, not, not a clever thing to do. Yes, I think manufacturers have a very important part to, uh, uh, in, this, in this issue. And I mean, talking to the guys at ACE, and they are very aware that it is a problem. It needs to be solved. There are those that uh, don't listen. But, you know, what I'm trying to say is, in spite of all that, if you, if you go back to the style of bike in terms of fashion, it's no, it's, there's not a great difference in, in, in terms of looking at the different styles. That's the point I was making. 
Okay, that's great. Thanks, Elaine. We're coming on. You've got a question for you later as well. So we'll hear from you later on if that's okay. Uh, Cheers. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in the audience want to chip in, or is there anything on the on the chat line that you want to bring to our attention, Ed? Um, I think we've got a couple of questions. Uh, they're slightly slightly taking the topic to a different subject, so we can come back to those, or or we can bring them in now. No, that's fine. If they're a different subject, that's absolutely fine. K Karen, I want I just want to give you the right to reply, as it were. You've heard what others have got to say. Do you have anything you want to add to your in, in, initial comments? Yeah, I mean, obviously dealerships is not our remit, so I can't really comment on that particularly, except to say that um, the campaign that we are planning at the moment will have the involvement of manufacturers and, deal and dealer representatives. So um, let's hope that, um, that something you know good comes of that and watch this space really is my message on that. Excellent, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to move on to another topic. We've already taken up 16 minutes, would you believe, on the first question? <laughs> Controversial. Um, I've got a question here from Andy Mithel, M M M Mickel Micklethwaite from, from, from Norfolk County Council. Is Andy in the audience? And if so, can you raise your hand, Andy? No, not there. That is it. Yeah. Hello, Andy. Hello, good morning, everyone. How are you, Andy? I'm fine, thanks. Uh, yeah, my question was for, for Colin, really, in terms of clarification, really, because um, in your presentation yesterday, you stated that casualties are a failure of the system, not the user. And I didn't understand the, the point that you were making. Um, on the face of it, that comment seems to preclude the possibility of the road user being to blame, which they obviously are in all but a few cases. On the other hand, the users are part of the system as defined in the safe systems approach. So what was the point that you were making about casualties being a failure of the system, not the user? And this is a presentation that Colin delivered yesterday as part of the, the, the event that we're running this week. So That's uh, correct, Colin, yeah. over to you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Andy, for the question. And like I say, I think, um, yes, when, um, when you raise that point, I think that is one of the, the difficult areas for, for me to, to articulate in terms of what exactly I mean. Clearly, the user is a part of the system. So what I'm talking about as a system failure is a, it's, a, it's a failure of the entire, entire system. Um, and the user is obviously a part of that system. Um, and again, this, this is what I'm... Uh, my thought processes around this are, are, are very um, fluid, shall we say. So this is an ongoing process. I'm not trying to claim that I've got a final solution that I can stick my hand in the air, air and say, I've solved it. Um, it is about uh, maybe just sort of like challenging everybody to, to, to um, think about how, how they view the system. Um, what, what, what my conclusion is, uh, and again, we've, we've kind of hit on it with the, the discussion about um, the role of the manufacturers and, and the, the dealerships and everything, is that basically everybody's got to accept, every part of the system has got to accept that it's got a role to play. Um, no one one part of the system has failed completely, uh, but every part of the system can be improved. That includes the user, absolutely, but it also includes all the other parts of it. So how the training is delivered, how the messaging is presented uh, to the user is a part of the system. Obviously, the engineering side. Um, so we, we're all familiar with the safe systems approach. Uh, I think that's absolutely correct. Um, but what we've got to do is just assume that all parts of the system need improving, not just one part of it. And so if you try and single out one part of the system, i.e. the user, you're going to get resistance because they're going to say, well, yeah, but what about everybody else? We all do it. Nothing is ever our own fault. Um, it's, it's the normal knee-jerk reaction from everybody. I know when I, when I have my accident, it certainly wasn't my fault. It was everybody else's. Uh, of course it was my fault, <laughs> or partly my fault, we should say. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we've, we've got to stop saying, yes, this is the one problem that needs to be solved. It's, it's, a, it's a partial problem of the entire system, not just one part of it. Does anyone on the panel want to come in before I go back to Andy to get him? To, is that Ian? Was that you tentatively? No, no, that was fine. No, no one else? Andy, back no, to that, you. That's, that's fine, Nick. Uh, that, that sort of clears that one up. It was, uh, it was just the way it was presented, Colin. It was just a bit confusing. I couldn't quite see what you were driving at, but that, no, that, that, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. 
Yeah, so I, I appreciate it. I, I can assure you that uh, putting together that video was not easy. Uh, first of all, just talking to a camera and not having an audience with any feedback is really complicated. It might sound very easy, but it's not. No, thank you. So perhaps if the, if, the, if the line had read, casualties are a failure of the system, not just the user, then, then we would have all been happy with it and, um, and uh, we wouldn't have had this question. But uh, there we go. Thanks, Andy, for that. That's, that's terrific. I'm going to move on to question number three, if I may, may now. And this is one that I'm raising on behalf of others, uh, which, which I raised it the other day, actually, in a, in a podcast with, with some, some other contributors. And it's a simple question, really. Is there any evidence or research that confirms that further or advanced training leads to safer riders and fewer collisions and casualties? If I could come to you, Chris, for this answer, answer this one first, if that's possible. Yeah, of course, Nick. I think, first of all, we need to know what you mean by advanced riding uh, training. I, I think, obviously, if you mean anything that takes place post-test, then that's uh, quite, a, quite a, a, a movable feast. And if you then want to try and think of um, defining or, or distinguishing between skills-based training uh, compared with perhaps attitude-based training, so something that actually trains the body compared with tra training, the, training the mind, um, the bottom line is that actually there's very mixed evidence and there's very mixed evidence for a whole variety of reasons. One of them being uh, that actually we're not necessarily comparing apples uh, and, and apples. We've got various different forms of training. Some will train the more basic skills. Um, some will train the, the higher level skills. If we look at the gadget project, we're aware of the different hierarchies of, of, of skills that are required in order to be a safe road user. Um, the problem with the evaluation of uh, training courses is that often it doesn't take that into account. So uh, the, 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 the level of skill that is being trained uh, isn't um, clear from the evaluation. It's also very difficult to um, compare uh, the different measures that one might take in terms of measuring the success or otherwise of a course. So if we were to look at for example, self-reports, um, it's the most convenient measure, but of course can be extremely biased if you've undergone training and you then subsequently had a crash um, or had a, a near miss, or you've recognized that actually that training may not have had the beneficial effect that you have uh, invested in, then you might be less willing to fill in your questionnaire and return it to the researcher than if you felt that actually it had all been worthwhile and that money that you had spent was a, a good investment for the future. So trying to compare people who have been on courses against um, comparable control group participants. So for example, the, we know the gold standard with any evaluation is this randomized controlled trial where participants are randomly allocated either to, in this case, a training course or a uh, kind of placebo condition, a control condition where they don't actually receive any training, but they receive some other form of intervention. Um, it's very rare to actually find a piece of research that has been able to have this randomized design and consequently pre-existing um, differences can affect the results. Self-selection can affect the results. We know that people who seek out training tend to be more safety orientated and risk averse than people who don't seek out training. Um, and so actually, again, trying to compare, compare like with like when we're comparing an experimental out of control group is a real challenge. Um, so th ultimately, the research is, is very challenging. And that's actually what has led to such a diverse array of different results where some uh, studies, there was a, a study a couple of years ago in Italy that actually suggested that uh, advanced, the form of advanced training they were investigating was beneficial in, in risk terms and in safety terms. Certainly the, uh, the, the instructor assessment of the risk um, of the rider's uh, behaviours was, was lower with the, uh, the, the trained group compared with the control group. But there's been plenty of other research that has either failed to find any difference or indeed has actually found that the uh, trained riders uh, had a higher risk threshold. They, were, they felt more confident, they felt more capable of uh, the challenges uh, of successfully completing the success, successfully addressing the challenges that the road environment presents. So um, this issue of confidence is one that has been brought up time and time again. Um, I kind of conceptualize confidence as a comparison between 
how capable, uh, in this case, a rider feels of successfully negotiating the road environment compared with how challenging, how difficult they feel that road environment is. And frequently skills-based training can increase perceived capability and actually reduce perceived task difficulty. And this has been found in a number of studies, not just within powered two wheelers, but there was the, the famous Scandinavian experiment with novice driver training, uh, engaging in skid pan training and assessment. And they actually found the crash and collision rates went up because people felt more capable of dealing with the challenging environment. And so they increased their exposure. So there's a lot of variables involved uh, and actually then coming up with a, a, a good randomized controlled trial is a real challenge, particularly where actually ultimately what we're interested in is the number of crashes that people have. Um, we know, for example, there is a review of STATS-19. Uh, we know that uh, sadly the TARN data, the injury data the NHS is able to provide hasn't been incorporated within STATS-19. And consequently, even from police records, uh, we know that those data are a little unreliable. So if we're looking at STATS-19 data, um, we, we know that that's a, an unreliable source. There's an awful lot of subjectivity involved. In the, in the assessment of the severity of any crash. We know DVLA can be very protective of their data regarding penalty points. Uh, certainly Endors uh, had a, a real challenge trying to access those data in order that they could test to see if somebody had been referred to a, an Endors course in the previous three years. So there, there are some major challenges involved, Nick, and, and actually a lot, of the, a lot of the studies have actually demonstrated that uh, advanced training can be a bad thing, um, genuinely, I believe that actually if we can train the mind, if we can speak to the brain before we then train the body, then that is the best approach. Um, certainly that's the approach that we take with ride, with the uh, power two-wheeler offenders. Um, having just skills-based training on its own, though, uh, I genuinely believe is, is a bad thing because of the increase in perceived capability and the reduction in the perceived task difficulty. You've got to get the head in the right place before you train the body. Thanks, Chris. It's a very comprehensive response. Does anyone on the panel want to chip in? Ian, yeah? Yeah, um, I do agree with everything that Chris has said. However, um, there is a skills deficit and we can't deny that. And that deficit does need addressing. When a rider comes through the DVSA test process, uh, we will find practically day to day a situation where they're, they're getting themselves onto you know, really quite powerful machines um, without in some cases without the confidence, in many cases without the ability to, to pilot that machine successfully in, in multiple road situations. You know, one of the most common causes of, of crashes in a rural area is losing control on a left-hand bend. Um, and that could be a cognitive issue, but it, it could also be that skills deficit. So I wouldn't want the, um, the, the training industry to be written off. Obviously, vested interest, I enjoy motorcycle training. It's something I actually you know, get a lot of pleasure from. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to get to a point where we're saying, well, you know, we, we don't want to be thinking about the skills side. It is something that has to be addressed. We need to be able to train riders to ride better. But uh, Chris is right. We, we can't just improve the skills without everything else. And within that industry, um, I think we've all seen some exceptionally good practice in, in it being done very, very well uh, by good trainers blending the learning, bringing in certain elements. And yes, I, I'll be honest, Chris, I've nicked parts of the ride course when I've been doing on-road training um, because, because they, they fit a, a situation particularly well and they're a brilliant explanation point. Um, and we've also seen training delivered incredibly badly uh, with a slavish dedication to road craft um, and taking elements of that way beyond its intention for civilian riders and mm -hmm. causing frankly, more harm than good. So, yeah, I mean, to go back to the question, is there any evidence? I know John's been putting up in the chat that there is something from the Netherlands, but essentially, as far as I'm concerned, I haven't seen any definitive evidence. If somebody could provide that evidence, and it is going to be difficult, as Chris said, that would be a marvellous thing. But we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. No. Ed, is there any, anyone raise their hand? Oh, co co sorry, Colin. Colin, did you want to chip in? Sorry. Yeah, just very quickly. I mean, the first thing to say is it's, it's a gloriously complex subject, uh, which is why it fascinates me. Um, I, I think um, it, it is interesting um, hearing hearing the, the comments that Chris made there and saying, um, I definitely think we need to, to catch up a bit after after this, Chris, because I, I want to ask you loads of questions. Um, but um, 
Yeah, I, I, I do think, um, as, as I said, that, that there's a difference between um, skills and behaviours. Um, and I think that that needs to be recognised. And I think a lot of the problem comes in terms of how we um, separate the two and then how we get the messaging right about the difference between the two. Um, I think that that is one of those key areas that I think um, uh, uh, could be improved. I mean, we talk about uh, advanced training and being a better rider, but the big question is, what is a better rider? Is a better rider actually somebody who's more skillful or is a better rider somebody who's safer? Uh, and the two are not necessarily always directly connected, I don't think. Good. Uh, Ed, is there anyone in the audience wants to participate? Yeah, just to, uh, just to elaborate on what Ian said, there's a comment from um, John Chatterin Ross, who says there's a report, report on attitude training done by the Dutch KNMB, which shows that effects last for at least 18 months. Uh, there's also a question from Elaine Hardy, who says, isn't there a major problem with the lack of qualified post-licensed trainers? Right. Okay, anyone want to pick up on any of those points? Um, I tell you what would be really useful. Sorry, Karen, I'll come back to you in a second. Let me just say what's on my mind or I'll forget it. Otherwise, Chris, if, if you could send me some links after this to any any studies that have been done in in this field it would be really and i'll, I'll circulate them i'll publish them basically because it is a question that i've been asked by a number of people recently is there any proof that 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 that, that extra training additional training uh, works and if you've got any links to any studies either way i'm not looking for something that can definitively provide us with an answer i'm just want to provide people with information really that would be very useful so perhaps you and i can pick up on that afterwards I'd be very happy yeah. to, Mick. The only, the only challenge there is that most of the evidence is published in scientific journals, which are not free, in fact, far from it. Um, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. But um, Google Scholar is usually your friend in this sense. Yeah, OK, that's great. Thanks, thanks, Chris, for that. Karen, you think you raised your hand in response, in response to something that's come up on the chat? I would just say that this SWAV report that um, John refers to is well worth a read, and you can get it free because I've got it from somewhere. <laughs> So it's one thing at least that you can have a look for. Um, I would, in, re in uh, regards to Elaine's question about post-test trainers, I mean, that's a really interesting one because unlike in law, where to be a, an instructor pre-test, you have to be qualified, you know, you have to be approved by DBSA or for CBT, you have to be assessed by a, an approved instructor. However, to be a post-test trainer, you don't have to take any formal qualification. I could do it. I wouldn't be very good, but I could do it. Um, so I, I think what we, we don't know, whether there's a shortage of good post-test trainers, to be honest. Um, I would use the ERS registered trainers as an example of trainers who have undergone a DVSA assessment and, and are likely to offer good training. And there are quite a few people on that register. Uh, I'm sure the representatives from IM and Rossbert have got, you know, various procedures that they use for their instructors. But all I would say is, we don't really know because there is no set prescribed qualification or, or, or entity that says you are, you know, you're a competent trainer. And that, that seems like a bit of a loophole to me. Thanks. Thanks very much. Oh, oh, Chris, did you want to come back quickly? Just very quickly. No, I just wanted to comment on, on what Karen has just said, which is absolutely the case. We, when we're recruiting trainers and instructors to deliver the ride course, uh, in coming up with the person specification, we had a real challenge trying to identify those who had post-test uh, uh, skills or, or uh, any other form of, of uh, motorcycle training. Um, and the ERS was one option, the, the Register of Post-Test post uh, Motorcycle Trainers, the RPMT was another. Um, but actually, I think it falls, it would have to fall to the DVLA to uh, address this. Uh, as they do promise us every now and again that they're going to, but we haven't seen anything materialise just yet. Thanks, thanks. For that. I'm going to move on to another topic now because we've still got quite a bit to get through and the time is racing away from us, is it, is, which is a good sign, of course. This this topic is, is Vision Zero, and I'd like Tim James from Wescatech to, um, to put the question if he's in the audience. No sign it? Yeah, Tim's here. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes, Tim, we're fine. Thank you. Good. Um, right. My question is, is to everyone. I know Colin brief, touched this briefly yesterday in his, uh, in his presentation. Um, <clears throat> Vision Zero appears to have bad connotations amongst the biking fraternity. Um, presumably over fears it will effectively end a much-loved way of life and a passion. 
Does the panel agree that this is likely? And if not, how does the panel suggest that the concept becomes more palatable to motorcyclists? Thanks, Tim. A good question. Ian, are you happy to, take, to lead on this one? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Tim. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I'm going to blame Chris entirely for this, frankly. <laughs> There's one slide on the ride course, which we, we use, and it, in that context, it works really well. And it quotes a guy called Rune Helvik, who, uh, Chris will credit me, was a Norwegian transport minister from many years ago who basically said, uh, if we take Vision Zero to its ultimate end, um, there is no place for motorcycle. And obviously, a lot of people have seen that over time, and it's sort of out there in the community. Um, I think it's fair to say that the motorcycle fraternity have an inbuilt paranoia, and I speak as one, uh, about legislation and what the government are going to do to us and what European legislation is going to have effects on us. Um, so I can understand where these, these fears come from. But what I would say is, um, Vision Zero, I, I absolutely believe in um, I, as a concept. I'm working with it. I'm working with organisations writing policies around Vision Zero. It's a fabulous goal and it, it's a way of focusing our industry and the public to um, really sort of deciding, is this important enough to deal with? The fact that we do not accept road death as an inevitable thing. So I think we'd all agree, Vision Zero, I think Colin said this in his presentation, as a concept, absolutely fine, but it, it's how it's interpreted. What we do tend to find is obviously Vision Zero comes hand in hand with the safe systems approach, which we've touched on already. And what we're finding is that a lot of people are cherry picking from the safe systems approach uh, to, to put elements of it into their strategies and policies. Um, but there are very few organisations or local authorities or, or governments even who are using the safe systems approach and using Vision Zero properly. Um, if you wanted to see it done properly, I would quote, for example, Cambridgeshire uh, as, as an authority that have embraced Vision Zero, but have embraced safe systems properly. And I won't go too much into the safe systems because Colin's talked about it already and he's, he's explained it quite well. It is that element where everything needs to work completely in harmony. And if one element fails, the other elements pick up the slack and protects people. I can't see, I mean, I've worked in the government body for 35 years. Um, you know, I can't see a situation where that paranoia is going to come to light and motorcycling will be banned. Um, over time, we've had restrictions put in, uh, be they based on emissions, be they, be they based on um, type of approval, whatever it might be, minor things. I mean, we could go back and get like a poke Colin with a stick and talk about crash helmet laws and, and the MAG position on that. You know, things have changed over years and things will continue to change. That will always be the case. Will it ever get to the point where a government is going to sort of slam the hand on the desk and say, ah, oh, these motorcyclists are too dangerous, let's get rid of them? No, I don't think that's ever going to happen. But what I would say is we can reduce the chances of, of further restrictions, firstly, by making sure that we do Vision Zero and safe systems properly, and secondly, by getting our own house in order. We do have, as a community, as motorcyclists, a responsibility to ourselves and others to stop getting it wrong as much as we do. Thanks, Ian. Okay. Anyone else on the panel want to chip in? Yeah, uh, Co Colin, is that? Yes, it probably won't surprise you to, to know that I'm quite keen to chip in on this one. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, Ian makes a very good point. I mean, I think a lot of the problem is the, the fact that uh, there is this cherry picking go that goes on. Um, I mean, I, I'm looking at uh, right, right, literally before before uh, jo joining this meeting, uh, a consultation response on a, on a Vision Zero strategy for, for, for a local authority. Um, and all I do is go through it saying, yes, but you're contradicting yourself within your own document is that you're not actually applying the principles of the safe systems approach in your own strategy. Um, so it, it is a case of um, th there is um, not necessarily bias in, in the Vision Zero itself, but bias in terms of how, how the uh, Vision Zero is applied. Um, and as I say, with, with uh, like I say, the, the comments that were made back in the early days about Vision Zero and motorcycling not fitting, um, I noticed that uh, the Scottish uh, uh, road safety strategy um, referenced a, uh, a academic paper that looked at Vision Zero and, and why it wasn't gaining traction um, as, as it should. Um, I, 
again, I, I've contacted the, the lead author and, and asked, asked questions on that. And I says, you know, I, I cannot see even now, despite all the backpedaling on motorcycling doesn't fit, I can't see how motorcycling does actually fit within Vision Zero. And I think part of the problem is that as well as looking at road safety, it also comes down quite heavily on promoting active travel. Now, promoting active travel is not something that I think is a problem, but it can lead to a conflict because you've got two priorities in the same policy. Um, so if you, want, if you want to promote active travel, uh, I mean, segregation of road space is one of these things that, that keeps on coming up from a motorcyclist perspective. Um, and when we look at the recent review of the highway code, um, vulnerable road users were, were the, the subject of, of interest for the review of the highway code, but it didn't include motorcyclists in the, in the stakeholder groups that were involved in it. Um, why not? You know, are we, are we something separate or do we sit outside of this whole concept of a vulnerable road user and the rest of us, you know, because we're a motorized form of transport. We're not active travel, but we are vulnerable. Um, so it is a case of, you know, why, why, why can we not find a way to fit everything in together? Um, and again, from a purely personal perspective, I do, um, you get a certain amount of, uh, I mean, target fixation is something that we talk, we talk about when it comes to, to motorcycling and things going wrong. And I think there's a little bit of target fixation that goes on with Vision Zero because we talk about what goes wrong, but we hardly ever seem to talk about what goes right. What we forget is that, yes, there's a large number of people who get injured and killed on the roads, but there's far more who don't. Why don't they get killed uh, and injured? Why don't we focus on what they're doing right rather than what those ones are doing wrong? Um, so again, it's one of these, yeah, my, my, my preference would be a, a vision 100%, which is 100% safety on the road, uh, not vision zero, which is uh, removing the thing that we don't want because we all focus on what we don't want rather than what we do want. Very interesting, two very different views there of the, the, the vision zero concept. Anything in the audience, Ed? Um, no, the tech line is quiet at the moment. Okay. I'm sorry, we have, a, we have a raised hand from Sean Leonard. Um, yeah. who I will allow to talk and come, come in on the subject. Hello, Sean. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So for those that don't know me, I'm uh, Sean. I'm the chair of the Australian Motorcycle Council. Uh, I'm also a qualified road safety auditor. Um, so look, I've been heavily involved in this space in Australia over, say, the past decade. And, and I guess I kind of feel that, you know, Vision Zero is in, in the broader road safety community has got so much traction. Uh, the safe system approach is, is certainly, you know, almost globally endorsed. And I think for, for motorcycling, it's a case of r rather than sort of be too worried about the terms or is there a different way of approaching it, just accept that, that those sort of two things are a part of the global approach and, and keep going as we are about how does motorcycling fit into this and, and very much about when things are being considered about how to, you know, say improve the road environment about always being there, you know, reminding people about, you know, motorcycles, power two-wheelers, the growing use of these in both developed countries and, and significantly in middle-income countries as well. Um, still a long way to go, though. I mean, you still see so many different policy documents or the example that Colin just gave where, you know, there's a consultation meeting about transport or road safety and, and, uh, and, and motorcyclists still overlooked in so many cases. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. So what Colin's say, what Sean's saying, Colin, is that you should be involved in So sorry, say say that again. It broke up. What Sean's saying is is he wants motorcyclists to get involved with the embrace the concept of Vision Zero. I think yes, mo motorcyclists want to get involved, and so certainly for for Mag, I say we're we're not a road safety organisation, but yes, of course we want to get involved in road safety. We've got a vested interest in uh, in our members not dying because we want them to keep paying the membership fee. Um, but uh, yeah, the the the, the bottom line is, I, I think uh, again there is this standoffish approach um, in that um, many road safety practitioners have never ridden a motorcycle. And that is recognized by motorcyclists when you get a road safety practitioner talking to you about what is the best thing to do when you're riding your motorcycle when it's clear they haven't really got a clue because they've never tried it. Um, so yeah, I think we definitely need motorcyclists involved in the, in the road safety environment. Um, and like I say, breaking down the barriers to the communication is probably one of the biggest challenges that we've got. 
Thanks. Tim, just before we move on, did you want to come back and say, add anything to the discussion or give us your view on whether you think motorcycling is a legitimately involved a part participant in the Vision Zero approach? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, they were great answers. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to, to all of them. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think moving forward, the motorcycle industry should probably be uh, more involved or get themselves more involved in it and um, and work with the with the road safety community to, to, to that end um, my personal opinion thanks thanks for that um, Tina Giles has just said on the chat line I'm a road safety officer and have owned five motorbikes I think it's in response to your comment comment Colin about a proportion of road safety officers not being having any experience of riding a bike and I think Ian also put someone specifically in post in Norfolk to, to address the power to wheeler riders I'm guessing someone with experience Ian but uh, anyway it's an interesting point Colin uh, well made thank you very much can I move on because we are running out of time. I'm gonna to have to move on to another subject. And this is the subject of compulsory ABS. And it's John Chatterton Ross from the Safer Roads Foundation. John, I know you're in the audience. So Ed, can you can you unmute John, please? Yeah, I'm just gonna say, here we go. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can, John. Yeah, apologies for the dog in the background, barking at the postman. Um, yeah, I retired from the FIM uh, last year and I'm now with the Safer Roads Foundation and a uh, big program once COVID is under control is more ABS in uh, uh, Asia and Latin America. But we still have this issue in, uh, in Europe where there is the option for CBS on the A1125, an option that's generally taken up mainly by the Chinese and uh, Indian uh, companies, but Honda produced quite a lot of CBS stuff for the big market in Italy. Just wondering on the views, particularly of the industry, um, on um, closing this loophole and making it ABS for everything. Karen, do you want to on this one? Yeah, I mean, in our view, to be honest, the systems are adequate in terms of functionality. Uh, and from a safety perspective, I mean, technology has a role to play, but it should be adopted where it's relative to the benefit and the risk. Um, the systems that we're talking about fitted to much more lower powered machines with a far more limited performance uh, than others. And so the systems are designed to manage the performance that the bike can achieve. Um, we don't believe there is added benefit from a road safety perspective to having ABS on the small bikes. But if anybody has qualified and formed research that, that shows different, then we'd certainly be happy to look at it and take it up you know, with our manufacturing members who in turn would then have to take that up with Japan or Italy, depending on China or wherever, ultimately, because it won't be a GB decision for sure. Yeah. Anyone else on the panel want to comment on this one? Yeah, Ian? Yeah, I mean, just, just from the perspective of the user, really, because the small capacity motorcycle has always been a cheap method of transport. And it's, it's a rite of passage for some working up to larger bikes like that. But for a lot of people, it is just your everyday getting from A to B mode of transport. And these technologies come with cost and they come with complexity that needs to be maintained. So if this stuff is forced onto the machine through legislation, you're going to end up with more expensive bikes that are more difficult to, to fix and maintain over the coming years. So again, it's undermining the position of the small capacity motorcycle as a legitimate form of transport. So it's just for purely that reason. It's an appropriate level of technology, isn't it? Is yeah, absolutely you right. want the riders to be safe, but yeah. you've got to be careful to not go overkill. Totally. John, are you happy with those answers? Or do you want to, come, oh, sorry, Colin wanted to say something, Colin. I think, um, so certainly from, from a rider's perspective, um, and I'm, I'm going to be in, entirely um, personal in my response here. I haven't uh, haven't uh, gone too far down the route of asking other, others' opinions on this particular subject. But, but from my perspective, I know that uh, I've driven cars with ABS. Um, I have now got my first motorcycle that's got uh, ABS as well. Um, I have never actually had a situation where the ABS actually engaged in either vehicle. And I think that's partly because if you drive safely, you don't actually need ABS. It's only if you drive unsafely. So there is going to be this element of if you're going to put a technological solution into it, people are going to be taking more risks. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, I do think that um, it is one thing that uh, making it compulsory may have some unintended side effects as well as uh, as well as the benefits. Yeah, Chris. Just very briefly, Nick, um, the, the, I am aware of some research that has looked at, for example, comparisons of ABS against airbags, for example, in uh, not in motorcycles, but in cars. Um, there was the famous German um, uh, taxi study that, that had half the fleet with ABS and the other half without, and they through black, black box recorders, they were able to uh, detect uh, an increased uh, risk amongst those drivers who were driving the ABS equipped uh, vehicles simply because ABS actually provides you with some feedback. You know when it's engaged, it makes you feel safer because you know that's what it's supposed to do. With something like an airbag where its presence doesn't make you you aren't aware of its presence until it's actually needed um, that doesn't affect behavior and so we do need to think quite carefully about technological innovations that provide the user with some feedback because their behavior is likely to change as a result thanks for that that's a good point john did you want to say anything on this before we close it off do you want to come back john no I'll just ask him to unmute himself if he does want to. Come. Yeah, naturally, I'm incredibly disappointed with all of the replies. Um, I think you really need some education. So I'll send you a whole load of documentation, photographs, demonstrations that we've done. And the closing point I'd make is all this twaddle about cost. An NMAX Yamaha 125 cheap scooter is actually made in the Jianxi factory in Communist China under Yamaha license, and it's sold in the UK. So please don't come up with this, oh, it costs too much money, because that's absolute rubbish. Okay, John, thank you very much. If you want to send anything to me, I will gladly forward it on to our, our panellists and, and, and anyone else that's interested. But uh, I, 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 think, I think we'll move on to the next question, if that's okay. Not because I'm trying to avoid controversy, but I'm just conscious of the time that we're spending on stuff. So is there anything on the chat line, Ed, we need to pick up on? Um, yeah, there's been a, been a couple of comments. Um, one from Kevin Williams who says, I have a 12 year old ABS bike. Uh, the ABS have never needed maintenance. Uh, and also a comment from David Davis, he says, um, that's like the old debate about seatbelts and risk compensation. Right, yeah, so, so some varying views on this subject. It's fascinating, thanks. And Sean, just, just to say you, you're very welcome. I guess you're in Australia at the moment. And of course, this is one of the benefits of, of delivering this conference via Zoom rather than per, in person, that you're, you're able to participate, which is fantastic. Even though you're probably losing your sleep, I think, at this time of day. But uh, it's good to have you involved. Thank you very much. Um, can I move on to Keith, a question by Keith Baldock, please, um, about CBT? Keith, are you there? Here we go. Hello, Keith. Keith from Brighton and Hove. How are you, Keith? Does he need to unmute? Uh, he's unmuted. Hello, Keith. First technical hitch. Well, you, you talked about the positives of technology. Here, the negatives. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. I'm going. To, I'm going to read your question out, Keith. If that's okay, because we can't hear you. I'm going to. I'm going to read out the, the, the essence of your question. But Keith, Keith's asking what can or is being done to improve the CBT? It was never really designed to license riders for job riding, delivery riders, basically, more as a first step to travel on moped. He's also raising a case, a question about the riders from foreign backgrounds who are to often totally alien to our road culture. They appear more at risk on our roads, but he hasn't found any robust data to support this. So what Keith's asking really is, is the CBT up to, to task in terms of people that are now, the increasing number of people that are riding as part of their job? Uh, and secondly, is it, is it doing the job also for, for foreign riders who are new-ish new to, new to this country? Anyone want to pick up on that one? Ian. Yeah. Um, first thing I'll say is anybody who's interested in this should have a look at the presentation on your conference next week on Thursday the 25th where uh, Tanya Fosdick and Rain Willis are talking about the Ride Free yeah. um, project that they've been involved in, um, which really does look to make significant changes to the delivery of CBT. So I would urge um, Keith and everybody else to make sure you tune in for that one. Uh, I mean, I was there in, in the very early days delivering CBT when it first started, and it seems like a very long time ago now. Uh, and, and when it was brought in, there was a feeling that it was... I think a very naive feeling that it was purely just that, that slight introduction to people getting going on the road uh, and they would then pick up their further training and enhance their skills and, and, and their, 
the knowledge from that point onwards. And as we know, as practitioners, um, the, the riding community, for whatever reason, essentially would do the CBT and not engage with any further training until they absolutely had to, either to acquire a license or do the CBT again in, in three years or that would be two years. So is it fit for purpose? No, I don't think it is. Um, it, it does the best job it can do, but it, it, it absolutely does need a, a lot of enhancing. And the ride free approach was really looking at what CBT is now and, and what can be done to make it better. Uh, it's crucially important we get this right because it is, when we're talking about young riders and you know, we now have the gig economy that, that Keith has touched on, sort of coming into this as well. So young or new riders, this is the only opportunity that realistically we will get to uh, you know, as, a, as an industry to, to get them safe. Mm -hmm. So as it stands at the moment, CBT sort of does the job but could do it a lot better. There are questions about standards of delivery and and the way that CBT is overseen by DVSA. And again, I'll just reach for my soapbox and start ranting about that, but perhaps another day. Um, but yeah, it, it really needs to be improved. And something like the ride free approach, where you're looking at adding modules to it, is, is fabulous. But until it is introduced as a compulsory element across the board nationally, it won't have the effects we want it to. Yeah. Anyone else want to comment? Yeah, Colin? Um, obviously, uh, C CBT is, is one of those things that, uh, yeah, I think probably the vast majority of people who are involved from a road safety perspective would say it's not fit for purpose. Um, I think um, one one of the um, uh, again, don't don't necessarily quote me on this figure because I'm not, I'm not sure if it's particularly accurate. But but I tried to establish how many people take CBT, then actually carry on and uh, take a full license. <laughs> I suspect that the number is as low as something like one in five. Now, if only one in five people who started learning how to drive a car with an instructor actually took a test, I think something everybody would agree that something had gone seriously wrong. Um, so yes, as a CBT as an introduction is just a preparation for the next stage of um, taking a full license, it's clearly failing. Um, there's lots of reasons for it. Um, and I think, yeah, again, it's something that needs a lot of unpicking. But what I'm very conscious of, and obviously in my role in terms of, of a, a lobby organisation, is that there has been consultations on the CBT. Um, actually, everybody agreed uh, on outcomes as a result of that, but it's actually been held up because it hasn't been put into the legislative programme to actually introduce the legislation that enables those changes to the CBT to take place. So, so there is actually a roadblock in terms of the will to get this done from a, um, a, a political point of view, um, which is, is, is a, a big worry for me. Um, I would like to see this, um, this push forward, um, get, obviously we need to know what a better form of CBT is uh, before we necessarily change the legislation. But I think a lot of that work has already been done and it's now been effectively held up by um, you know, the need for a few parliamentarians to get together and say, we're gonna put this into our program of legislation. Yeah, yeah, good. Ed, there's been a bit, a bit of chat on the chat line. Do you want to bring, bring us one or two of the comments that are coming through? I think generally in support of, of, of Keith raising this issue. Yeah, yeah, there's been a couple of comments. Um, one from Nick Evans who says, uh, Keith's question is absolutely right. Delivery riders, uh, delivery drivers and riders are a huge issue. Uh, driving, riding styles and the lack of insurance and cover. Uh, there's also a comment from, uh, sorry, the name's just gone off, but it says that, uh, Pass the test, get a full license for a one two five issue is deterring younger riders from moving on from a CBT. There's no point for them. That's from Kevin Williams, by the way. That 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 that, that point. Good, interesting, fascinating. Anyone want to add any more before I move on? I'm going to take the yeah, Karen. Sorry, yeah. I'll just very quickly reiterate what Kevin said. I mean, the third driving license directive removed any incentive for anyone to take a one two five test, and that's that. You know, instead of making things better, that made things worse. In effect. Um, so I think we do need to look at licensing, not just CBT. Um, and also I would, in the, in the DVSA's defence, I would say they've closed down some, quite a few uh, D, uh, ATBs recently for, for not delivering a good CBT, because a good CBT isn't bad, it really isn't. Um, but there are a lot of roads out there and the DVSA are clamping down and are finally doing something about it. And some quite large businesses have been shut down in the last few years. So that's Thank it really. <laughs> Thank you. Chris? Just a very quick one, Nick. Um, 
not related to CBT, but certainly related to uh, gig economy riders that we've been discussing. Um, there is a plan for Endors to uh, develop a new offender course for uh, gig economy riders. So for riders of small, small machines, this may be the first intervention that they've had any form of training since they passed their CBT. So this is an opportunity that we're, we're, we're very um, uh, motivated to pursue. Yeah, great. Now, um, unless there's any, anyone, no one's got their hand raised, Ed, no one want to participate at this, this stage? No, not at the moment. I'm going to, I'm going to take, I'm going to end this session at 10 past 12, if you've all got 10 minutes panellists you can spare, because no one's dropped off and it's, it's fascinating, there's still one or two topics to go, so I will finish it at 10 past 12, because all, all good things need to come to an end, but uh, can I ask Carla Lowe if she's in the audience, she's got a question about courier companies, which relates quite nicely to what we've been talking about already. Carla, are you in the audience? Yeah, Carla's here. I am, I am, brilliant, can you hear me? Yeah, we're, 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 yeah we're, we can we can hear you loud and clear. You're from the City of Westminster, aren't you, Carla? I am. I'm a road safety officer there. Um, afternoon, everybody. Um, mine was with the recent um, High Court ruling with Uber drivers being classified now as employees. Um, does the panel see a surge in courier companies seeking more support and training for their riders from local authorities? Or is that wishful thinking? I, I'm a, I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to comment on that, or is it just a, a, a just a, a Colin? Um, I, I think the the whole gig economy question is again, it's another very interesting one. I, again, I can see it from both sides from from a commercial model. Uh, they they've put together a business based on uh, riders who uh, uh, who have got easy easy entry into the industry because they only need to have a CBT. They haven't got to. Uh, invest in a, in a full license. Um, so I can see why there is a resistance from it from a commercial perspective. Um, but again, I do think that it is something that, yeah, why is it that a motorcycle courier is the only type of courier who can do the job on L plates? So you, can't, you can't drive a van to deliver on, on L plates, so why can you ride a motorcycle to do it on L plates? I think it's, um, it's a pretty ridiculous situation. Um, the uh, as to whether or not there's going to be a large number of companies coming forward um, asking for, for more help and advice in training their staff, I do hope that that is a result of the Uber one, but um, I seriously doubt it if I'm perfectly being, being realistic. Anyone else want to comment on this? Karen? Um, yeah, I'll just come in quickly. I, I just recently had an interview with the health and safety executive who are looking at updating that uh, driving and riding at work regulations and I was hoping to see uh, quite a bit in about this and the draft that I saw had two bullet points both pointing people at the highway code um, so I spent two hours explaining to them why that was fairly inadequate for gig economy riders but I think that unless the health and safety executive does intervene and say what how things should be i think uber and the likes that can pretty will pretty much carry on as they are i would imagine until they're told they can't yeah, good thank you right now i i, I colin very quickly and then so, yeah j just very quickly on that uh, health and safety executive uh, uh, the question of gray fleet i think is also an interesting one because uh, as i say currently uh, any any employer who uh, is is paying somebody to do a job that involves using their own vehicle has to have that vehicle listed on Grey Fleet, but clearly that doesn't uh, doesn't apply to uh, to gig economy workers. So uh, I think that is something that needs to be tightened up and could be a big benefit. Great. I'm going to take one more question, if that's okay. I'm going to move on from this one. Thank you. There's just a fascinating discussion in a big area, obviously, that we could spend a lot more time on. The final question for today is going to come from Elaine Hardy. So, Elaine, if you can be uh, make yourself known to Ed. And it's about calculating risk. Now, it's quite a complex question, Elaine. If you could be as concise as you can, bearing in mind we've got six minutes left, so we want to leave time for the question and an answer. So, Elaine, over to you. Okay, I'll be quick. In the, so in the preamble, you mentioned billion uh, miles travelled to compare cars and motorcycles in terms of calculating risk. But in my view, it's like comparing apples and pears because the dynamics are completely different and I'm sure the panel is fully aware of this difference. Further to that, even the D uh, DFT admit that these estimates have a higher level of uncertainty for small subgroups as, such as motorcycles. So my question, does the panel think that measuring billion miles travelled really helps to understand how to calculate risk. Is there not a better way? Or should we simply stop comparing factors of road users? 
Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. It's very succinct. Right. Who wants to pick that one up? No one. Okay. I'll, I'll <laughs> kick off if nobody else wants it. Ian, um, go first. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fair question. Um, as, as with any sort of statistics, you, know, you can cut the pie however you want and essentially make it say pretty much whatever you want. Um, but the, of course, the issue is that you're dealing with um, a very specific type of road user. And if you look at it under any lens, you know, a rider getting on a bike on a Sunday to, to take their Ducati for a two hour blast is going to be entirely different to somebody who is jumping in a car to get from A to B. You're talking about emotion, you're talking about motivation, uh, an entirely different reason for being out on the network. So if you're looking at comparing mileages um, or kilometres, whatever it may be, you could argue, yeah, it's, it's not relevant. And you could probably also argue that every kilometre travelled by the, the hobbyist rider, potentially there is a higher level of risk than somebody in a car every day travelling down the motor. But you have to measure something. And to me, that's the important thing. We have to have some form of measure where we can identify what the problem is on the road network we need to address. I don't have the answers to this. Um, I, I wish I did. Um, and as yeah, I don't think anybody has really come up with a definitive answer. But yeah, you're, you're quite right. The, the blunt analysis of road user types under one lens is never going to give us the full picture of what's going on. So we need to, to really think harder about how we're going to do it. Anyone else? <coughs> Colin. Um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, like I say, it is a very, very interesting question. And say, I think um, Chris mentioned earlier about the Stats 19 figures, that there is a certain amount of inaccuracy and maybe even bias in, in the way some of, some of the figures are recorded. So um, it, it does, um, I think we, we need to take the statistics with care, with a pinch of salt at all times. Um, I do often find that when I look at a lot of studies, they tell me something that I could have guessed without without doing the study. So I think gut instinct, uh, we can trust it quite a lot. Um, so like questions about whether or not advanced training uh, improves, you'd, you'd need to be a very brave man to say it, it has no impact. Um, uh, it's hard to see how, how, it's, um, how it can uh, have an adverse effect. But I think, yes, we need to be very careful about the figures and taking it as yeah, th there's a set of statistics that, that that proves that motorcycling is a bad thing and we need to ban it. Uh, because I think that is the fear. Uh, and again, this, this comes back to the uh, how we communicate road safety and get people to actually change their behaviours. Uh, we need to uh, pull down barriers, not create barriers. I think Chris might take issue there with one or two of the things you've said there about the value of research and things, but that's for another day, Chris. So uh... I'll, I'll park that for the time being. <laughs> but yes, it'd be good to have a conversation about that sometime, Colin. Anyone else want to comment on this one before I close the, the session down? Elaine, do you want to come back and just comment on what's been said? Yes, please. Just, uh, just a bit quickie. Um, as you know, I do, I've done a lot of study on uh, crash investigations uh, over the years. One thing that, that fascinated me, you, do you know that between 5 and 10% of, uh, of road deaths are natural causes? I just want to throw the cat amongst the pigeons here. So if we're, we're talking about statistics, it gets muddy. And my concern is that we're just so keen on all oh, they they're a problem we have to solve it I, I don't think I don't see it like that um as you know uh, Nick I've sent you other stuff as well but what I, I'm simply saying is there must be a better way than billion miles travel yeah thank you Elaine it's a point well made I think no one's going to argue with that I don't think but uh, anyway look I am going to draw it to a close now I'm I, I'm conscious of people having other appointments and things that they need to go to and lunch of course as well very important uh, it's absolutely whiz by. I've, I've found it really enjoyable to, to, to host this session and I'd like to thank Ian, Colin, Chris and Karen for their contributions and spending the time with us. I'd like to thank all of you 50 plus people who stuck with it all the way through and provided some excellent discussions. I think it's been a really good session and, uh, and I've really enjoyed it and that's usually a good sign. So thank you all very much indeed and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the Power to Wheel online event which is running for another two weeks and, um, and that's it from us. So